All right, guys. We're now going to the direct to video market here with American Pie Presents Bandcamp on Rated I Might Add. Um, <clears throat> so, this first popped up. What did I first see this? Um, it was on TV, weirdly enough. It was on like TBS late at night. And heavily, I might add, heavily cut. Because, of course, they have to. Um, because, <clears throat> like, the only one that I've seen released with just an R-rated cut is Book of Love. And I'm not sure what the difference is on that. Maybe more boobies, I don't know. But I remember watching this and being like, you know, this isn't that bad. It's kind of in the same spirit as the first three. And you know what? You know, they recast the role because the original Matt Stifler was the uh, the kid who did the voice for an Iron Giant, the kid in the Iron Giant. And so they recast with Tad Hildenbrink, which that's a name. But, uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, <laughs> and I think. He does a great job in the role. He, it's like maybe he watched, uh, I almost said Ryan Reynolds, Sean William Scott in the previous films and took that because he's, he is definitely a stifler. And, uh, he, I think he does a great job. He does, he has the mannerisms down, the thing, you know, that kind of stifler thing. He has the mannerisms down, the, the, you know, the kind of, speak and everything how a stipler would talk you know and he's trying to follow in his brother's footsteps and yes this is your basic um redemption story where he's like one of the worst people in the entire world he's a bad person and he get by the end of the film he redeems himself you know that's what it is uh but i, li I, I like that they finally decided to i mean you get some of band camp in the second film but this really explores that. Like, hold on. I just can't. <clears throat> Too far. This really explores the band camp more. Uh, you got Tim Stack, who has a role in this film as, like, the leader. And you have Eugene Levy, who I think is the only actor that's been in every one of these films. Oh, you also have a, uh, a cameo from the Shermanator there for a minute. Chris Owen replacing his role there. He's a school guidance counselor now. And what happened is, as a prank on the band, he puts, what is it, a uh, KY jellies or something on it, on it that makes them burn or something. I don't remember what, exactly what it was, but on all the instruments, it makes their mouths burn or whatever. And, uh,. It's something. I remember what it was. Oh, pepper spray. That's what it was. It's pepper spray. This it takes okay, my jellies. It takes pepper spray and he sprayed. They spray. He and his buddies who aren't in the film for that long, which I thought was weird. Watching it this time, I'm like, hey, yeah, his friends aren't in it that long. And I guess it's the point is that he's gonna become a better person by the end. But all the other ones, the main character's friends are a part of the film. This is the one where he kind of. Is goes off on his own and <clears throat> not with his other friends who are off partying. Uh, as a punishment for this, he is forced to go to the band camp and learn a life lesson, whatever. Now, I'm going to disagree with this first part is, one, this, is, this part doesn't make any sense at first. So he's at this part where he enters in and everyone is sitting there they're being introduced, their bands and everything, and they're doing their celebrations and stuff. He leaves right before anyone else leaves, and s somehow, people from the opposing team, who will be the antagonists of this film, are already out of the the place and just standing there to uh, cause him trouble. Which doesn't make any sense because he's the first one that leaves, and suddenly, Brandon, I think his name is, you know, Matt Barr's character, and couple others are standing there and they immediately s decide to uh dig into him for not having on his 
his uniform or his beanie or anything. One, he just fucking got there. All right? He just got there. I know it's Matt Stifler. I know you're not supposed to defend him because he doesn't wear it for most of the film. But in all fairness, he just got there. He literally just got there and went to the auditorium thing. He had no way to put his stuff on. He just got He had his bag on him. He just got there. Give him some time. But no, not only do the students harass him, but also the the Tim Stack's character. Well, he 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 does hit the the walking stick thing into Brandon's genitals. But yeah, but still, the the one of the first things you need a uniform on. It's like he just got there. Give him time. I know he doesn't put on his uniform right away because he's trying. You know he's that. Oh, I'm gonna. Because he's just there to record, because he, he was sent there and he decides to make the best of it, and record naked women is what he's going to do. Now, in real life, this would be a no-no, because how many underage girls are there that could be using those showers? Because you think they got to be at least 16 to 18 years old, right? 15 to 18 years old, whatever you're in high school, right? So that's... A little eh, but I see what they were trying to pull forward. He's trying to be, he's trying to be like his brother and make these kind of movies that apparently Stifler made movies, and but yet we never see him do that in any of the films. He never has a camera or anything, does he? I don't think so. Yeah, Walkie Talkies in the second one, but here he supposedly made some kind of film about beach babes. I don't know. He's not mentioned. Like I said, Eugene Levy is the only one that carries over from. <clears throat> those films, and I'll probably get into that when we get to Book of Love, because I felt like another character should have been a part of it, but who knows. Um, also, I don't get the reducing points system. It's a camp. I understand, oh, hey, we gotta have points for this contest, but why deduct points? Okay, first of all, He's not part of their band. Right? That's the one thing that's always bugging about this. Matt isn't a part of the, the the East Great Falls band. He was forced to go there. So therefore, what he does shouldn't affect their band because he's not directly part of it. That that's always bugged me is that he does that thing in the cafeteria where he's going off on... Matt Barr's character again, and they take away two points, and then just five points straight off. And I'm just like, well, why is why are they getting punished for what he's doing? He's not part of their band. He's just forced to go there. I know he goes to their school, but that doesn't mean they should take. They should get punished for his actions just because they go to the same school. He's not in their band, and not not even officially in the film. If you think about it, he. He pretends to be a part of it to get close, but, like, he never really does anything except for the triangle, and he plays the the bagpipes, I guess, but I I, I do like that scene. Let's talk about that, because he has a a uh, showdown or a face-off against Brandon, and it's, for, it's an instrument, and he starts playing the triangle, and he goes and leaves and comes back with a bagpipe, which they talked about it earlier, him and Elise which is the main female protagonist, about how that he did that back in like sixth grade or whatever it was. And so you play it again and then they they win and get more points. But like at that point he was trying to be part of the team. Like what he was doing to be close to make them vulnerable, but you know what I mean. We got Jason Earls in this movie, you don't know who that is. That's Jackson from Hannah Montana. You thinking Hannah Montana with the Okay, I used to watch it. And, you know, back in the day, it was all right. But the, the, the weird thing is, is that he actually looks younger than he actually is. By the time he was done with that show in 2008, 2009, he was almost 40. No kidding. And this is 2006, so he had to be in his mid-30s playing a high school student. That's how young he looks. And they, you know, they, they, not, they make him like a, a kid. The first... 
the first show to actually acknowledge him as an actual adult was Kicking It, where he played Rudy. And even now, I'm thinking, well, why are they treating him such... And he's like, oh, he's actually playing an adult here, where, you know. But, yeah, he's in this, he plays Dr. Robot, or whatever they call him. <laughs> uh, whatever Matt calls him. He's, he's Matt's bunkmate. And the first third odds, he throws him in the closet and stuff. He throws, you know, Ernie, Ernie is his name, in the closet. And, and um, but then he helps him with the technical stuff because he puts the camera in the shower, but it causes lens fog because he didn't use the right lens. So they fix that. And I'm not, and once again, I'm not going to keep bringing up the fact that, I, you know, it's not right for, to be watching legal age naked women. But it's just, it's weird. Um, and even more so because there is a scene where they show Elise getting into the shower, but she stopped. But he either it glitches or he just stops it from watching it. And they're not seniors yet, so she's got to be only 17. Now, technically, he would only be 17 too. But still, it's weird. Um, moving away from that. Uh, what's his name? Omar Benson Miller? He's in like CSI and stuff. He's in this. He's pretty good. Uh, we got, like I said, Eugene Levy pops up from time to time to kind of lend advice like he usually does. Um, there is this one scene that involves a piccolo and some junk. Matt's junk. And, because that's not the, the Asian kid, I don't forget, I don't remember his name, I'm sorry, comes up to him and he's talking to him about how he wants to slap on some vibe oil and go to town on it. A piccolo. So while he's walking around, he he spies on Omar Benson Miller's character and a, 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 a woman, nigga, all freaky and stuff, which, once again, isn't he supposed to be 17? Keep going, keep going. And so, you know, turns him on. So he goes and he finds a piccolo and the valve oil and slaps it on, and he gets stuck. So they have to take him to the the macro again. They have to get it fixed, and that's when they're getting drunk. Now, here's a scene I want to talk about, ever so vaguely. Um, so uh, Matt decides that he's got to gain their trust after he calls his buddies because he can't get any good shots. He decides he's got to gain their trust. So he starts to hang out with them and be better, wear the beanie and stuff. And there's a certain scene where they're on the beach or something. They're relaxing in the sun. And it's the scene with the suntan lotion. And so they decide that Matt's going to whack off into it. So he goes into the bathroom, right? And he gets ready to go. And he starts visualizing all these, these girls that he knows. People that he... You know, a doll, you know, people that, you know, Cherie that was with Omar Manson Miller's character and Lisi, all the, you know, Ariana, the girl that sort of his girlfriend, but not really the girl that he likes. My problem with this isn't the fact that he's imagining them. It's the fact that they're, even though they sometimes wear sexy clothes, they're still clothes. It's an unrated movie. There's not one of them you can't show. Because, like, we just saw Cherie with her tits out. So we can't we can't see that. And it's... I, my, my, this is my point. No man would whack off and think of someone wearing clothes. That's just not how it works. All right? No man would do that. That makes no sense. I'm not going to say how I know. But I just know there's no way in hell he'd be whacking off to, to, with clothes because it doesn't make any sense. And then he, after he finishes, he, he's in a nasty toilet that's out of order. He flushes the cursing flush and it goes all over the place. And then you get the scene where they rub it on their faces and stuff. And just, blah, blah, blah. I know that's not real, but it makes you think. Yeah. And then we get to the Ipecac. Ipecac, which makes you puke, I guess. Ipecac. And we get it's the final thing. He get he's like they're mad at him for something. I think this is when they find out about the the uh 
spying. So what he does is he puts Ipecac, Ipecac in the grape cooler. And this isn't even his fault, but they do take it out on him. He puts the Ipecac in the grape cooler, and that's supposed to be for uh, Brandon, you know, what was it Brentwood, or whatever it's called. And Omar Benz Miller and the, China, the Asian guy, they switch the lids so they have good because they don't want orange. And it results in East Great Falls puking their guts out. And they blame it on Matt, which it is, but he didn't directly do it. He even tries to go out there and tries to stop him, but he doesn't realize it until it's too late. So then when he, he goes, and I don't understand why those two didn't think about it to begin with. Because they're just mad at him. And when he and Ernie show up to talk, they're ready to punch him. And he's like, hey, that's not my fault. Somebody switched the coolers. And that's when they're like, oh. But they should have realized that sooner. All right? As soon as they started puking, and then, you know, they started with Stifler, the two of them should be like, oh, shit. Um, that was meant for them, right? Oops. But no, they completely blame Stifler for it. They're going after him. And he's he's like, hey, that wasn't supposed to be for you. I switched the coolers. And they're like, oh, but the orange shit is janky, yo. Like, that's not an excuse. That's really not an excuse. You wanted, you didn't want orange. Okay. But just, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, again, it's really, well, you can blame Matt, but. It's really no one's real fault because he didn't he didn't know they would switch the lids and they didn't know there was something in it. So miscommunication on both sides there. And so because of the puking, East Great Falls was disqualified, even though it really should have been postponed and they should have been able to redo it because that's what's fair. I'm sorry, I don't like that movies where oh, one little thing happens and you're just disqualified. Uh Sometimes it makes sense, but here, they were puking, right? That's grounds for uh, suspension, like suspend it, like postponement. For You postpone it and come back to it. I understand this is a big thing, right? But it's not their fault. They shouldn't be penalized. Again, again, something Matt did. But... I guess at this point he could be part of the thing. But still, they should have had a second chance to do it. But Matt gets it back. He writes a fake letter to Elise. Pretend to be Dr. Troy, who, is, who, who she wanted to do an audition for. And, um, well, they, she finds it's a fake. And she hears the, um... Bunny, that's a deer. What? Bunny, that's a deer. Bunny, that's a deer. What? Now he's got me confused. Meh. Okay, back to my thing. So, she hears the bagpipes. And she knows it's Matt. She goes running out and he's out there. By the way, the two pieces of music that they play in here are actually instrumental versions of songs. Like, they play the... The the American Pie song. And then they play the airplane by um Tal Bachman. I, I feel like an aeroplane above the river. Yeah. And it so because like they play that instrumentally. She gets her internship and we also find out that Brandon got disqualified for plagiarism. Plagiarism, so he got his. And then they kiss, and as this happens, not her and Dr. Troy, but her and Matt, they kiss after she finds out that he... Like, here's another thing I have a problem with. She immediately thanks them, but not Matt. Even though it's obvious he was behind it, because she knew he sent the fake letter. So, she's like, oh, thank you guys. And they're like, actually, it's his fault. She's like, you? I'm like, well, yeah, you knew you sent the fake letter, huh? Anyway, they kiss, and it starts playing the song. I, I feel like an aeroplane. I was like, okay, that's really weird. They did that at the beginning, too. When they start playing that, that, 
the, this bed is on fire with passion, love, and they converse, they convert it to the instrumental version played by the band. And then they did it here too. And it's just like, okay, the only two songs you're allowed they couldn't they couldn't find any other songs to play, so just play instrumental version of the songs you had the rights for. <laughs> okay. This one's not bad. I really enjoy this. I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten. I really enjoy this one. The only one that's gonna top this is probably Beta House, because I love that one so much. But yeah, eight out of ten for sure. So what are you guys' thoughts on American Pie Present? Bandcamp, let me know in the comments below. Like, share, and subscribe. I've been Scotty. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.